Good evening and happy. It's bourbonblog.com live, and we have a very special guest joining us all the way from London, England tonight to taste some extremely old, rare bourbon whiskey from Buffalo Trace. It's the Last Drop Distillers Managing Director, Rebecca Jago. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me, Tom. It, it's great to have you. And we should also say not only is it Thanksgiving tonight, but it is also your birthday. So happy birthday. And Ed, glad we can share a, a dram on your birthday. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So this, this may be one of the rarest things that uh, I've tasted for a while. In fact, here's what it came in this beautiful box from the Loft Distillers Limited. And this, this truly is some of the, the the last drops of this particular bourbon whiskey. It is a 1980 Buffalo Trace bourbon, and there's worldwide, there's only 240 bottles of this. I mean, that's how rare it is, right? Yep. So this is, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pour this. I'm I'm so excited. I've been nosing it a little bit. I'm gonna pour it. Um, but you know, as I'm pouring this, tell me. You know who who are the last drop distillers? Tell me about what you what you all decided to do years ago. Okay. So so the last drop distillers was started by my father Tom Jago and his longtime colleague James F.B. and they both spent their the entire careers working in the drinks industry, mainly building big brands for big businesses. Um, and when they retired they decided to, to go to the opposite end of the world of spirits. And instead of, of creating these giant brands, they decided to go to Scotland and see if they could find a barrel of something truly exceptional and old. And they, they wanted really to see whether they could find some whiskey and bottle it and sell it as an independent. Um, so just two old men, aged 65 and 82 at the time. My dad was 82 when he started this new business. Um, but found some whiskey, about 1,300 bottles. They bottled it, and then James, more than my dad, to be fair, went off around the world with a product called The Last Drop in a bottle and started selling it. And, and James is an exceptional salesman and an exceptional marketeer, and he brought the bottles to, to the U.S., to China, to all over Asia, and sold them. He would sign them with gold pen if people asked him to. And I think that was the plan, was to, to see if they could do something to prove that it worked. And then somebody, whether it was a good idea or not, made the mistake of saying, what are you going to do next? And that's the point at which the, my dad went off to Cognac, where he had worked for a few years, and came up with what became their second bottling, which was a Cognac. And that immediately set them apart from the independent whiskey bottlers because they had a whiskey and then a Cognac. And that just set the scene for the, the future and where we find ourselves today, which is curators of the world's most remarkable spirits is how we like to describe ourselves. So anything, anything that can be successfully aged that benefits from aging, we will, we will look at and consider and hopefully continue to expand our range of spirits, which now covers scotch, cognac, bourbon and finally this year our first rum and hopefully more, more categories to come more categories in the future and what you're really doing is allowing people to uh the the enthusiasts to take a sip through time i mean this is something yeah. that uh, is very difficult to find uh just as i knows this here the um that bottle of bourbon i mean this is this came out it, this would have been 1980 about how old would this have been when it was when, when this would have been around then so this was distilled in 1980, but, and I, I really love this story because it was distilled right. by Gary Gayhart, who was the master distiller when it was still the George T. Stagg Distillery. And right. he was the man who recruited Harlan Wheatley as his apprentice. So, so there's this beautiful bit of synergy because Gary Gayhart distilled it, Harlan uncovered it in in... In, in around 2000, so long after the distillery had changed hands and changed name to become the Buffalo Trace Distillery. And it was he who determined that this, this was something really exceptional. And it, so it spent 20 years in wood before it was put into sustainless steel. And I don't want to mislead anybody and say sure. this is 
a 40 year aged bourbon because it's not and because I'm not sure anybody has successfully aged a bourbon to that that many years yet. Um, but that'd be, a long, that'd be a long time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but interestingly, I mean, another another whole conversation to have with the team at, at Sazerac is around what they're doing in Warehouse P. I don't know if you've been told about Warehouse B, where P, where they're cold cold maturing, refrigerated yeah. warehouse. Really exciting stuff. Um, but so this this twenty years in wood and then twenty years just resting quietly before we bottled it earlier this year. And uh, and so I just I love the, the just the the nice story of the two distillers, the one who made it, and the one who learned from him, and then chose it for us. It's a, no, it's a beautiful story. So this this was somehow tucked away at, at Buffalo Trace. It had been there since 1980. It'd been aging for 20 years. Yeah. Harlan finds it from from the man that actually recruited him and says, "Wow, this is something special." Only one bit. Was there only one barrel of this then, or no? I suspect there were 240 bottles in total. This must be the results of, that, of more, more than one not, barrel. Not a couple, right? This yeah. is so so rare. And um, again, I'm just nosing it here with you, Rebecca. I'm, yeah. uh, this is, uh, I can tell it's extremely old. Uh, just something, just really special. And uh, wow, what a, what an amazing treat for uh, for Thanksgiving evening. Again, this is something that. Absolutely. hundred bottles are getting to the U.S. of this, right? A hundred bottles will be in the U.S. Uh, yes. Yeah, so a hundred bottles will, will stay in the U.S. I, I think um, just, just to finish the story of the discoveries, obviously yes. when Sazerac bought Buffalo Trace or bought the George T. Stagg distillery, they bought everything that was there. So there were probably many, many odd parcels on in, on the inventory that, that weren't entirely documented or, or maybe often, and I, I talk about this a lot when we talk about discoveries, discovery isn't just about finding something that's hidden behind a wall, which in fact we did with one of our cognac. It's also finding what's inside, you know, with, with something like a majestic old blended Scotch whiskey. You'll know where the barrels are, but what you don't know is just the, 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 the pure delight of what lies inside it may, you may think oh that's just a that's just some old blend that nobody knows what it was and it can turn into this extraordinary and majestic spirit that deserves to be brought to light so i think that's that's another sort of interpretation of the word discovery maybe that's 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 so important that you're saying this because what you all have discovered with all of your spirits whiskies cognacs these are some that have these are they have stories behind them. They're beautiful in flavor. Do, do, can you show us the bottle of the of the bourbon there? I can. Yes, you know, please. That way we can uh, we can get a, a visual. And, and again, this is something. If you're looking for this, uh, yeah. it says yeah. the last drop 1980. Only thank you so much. Only a hundred bottles in the U.S. 240 worldwide. Yeah. And uh, this is extremely limited. And if you are, uh, you know, someone who is is collecting these bourbons that really wants th this flavor is beautiful. By the way, this is I'm delighted. So, I think the other, so deep. The other thing to say for those of your your listeners and viewers who don't know is that every bottle of the last drop comes with a miniature as well. So if you don't want to open your big bottle, if it's not your birthday and Thanksgiving, right, <laughs> right. you you might want to just open the little one. And, and save the rest. Jam with your with your best pal or your loved ones, and um, mm -hmm. uh, and then save. And then you know what you're saving for a special occasion. Then you can say, "Hey, I'm I'm going to really look forward to that bottle." Yeah, and, uh, exactly. that's nice that it comes with that a nice little a nice bonus to have that mini to share with someone, and then to have it tucked away in your cabinet. Um, exactly. People that have purchased these in the past. Uh, of course, you you all have been through around. Was it twenty one expressions the last twelve years? Twenty one releases. Just I'm now. sure you get a chance to talk to some of these people that purchase the bottles. Do they tell you, hey, we we actually really wanted to see what it tasted like? We cracked it open right away. We still have it in uh, in safekeeping. What do they tell you as far as how they experienced this? Oh, so very different from place to place. But we have some fantastic customers who we've who've really become friends and who we've known since the very beginning. 
And a couple of these guys in California have bought every single release. And they they are fantastic, they're wonderful people, but they also, they love to, to share and, and they like to open their bottles and drink them. So they're not keeping them all for a rainy day. But, but one of them, if he, the ones he hasn't opened, he knows when he's going to. So it might be that it's going to be for his daughter's 18th or, or his son's 21st or their wedding anniversary or just another special day. So I think there is definitely something celebratory about these super special bottles. And I, but I think it's also very much at, our, at the core of what we do is we want people to, to, to experience them and to drink them is, I feel passionately that spirits are for sharing, not for locking away, never to be seen again. I, I'm not, that's not my thing. I, I believe that drinking is, is about sharing and about pleasure. And that comes from you know, opening your bottles and enjoying the moment. It's so important and it helps us celebrate uh, so many important moments like birthdays, Thanksgivings. I have a feeling that some people watching it are thinking, what am I going to crack open whenever, uh, you know, this, this, uh, you know, and, and, and this pandemic is over. I mean, it, I know I'm sure that there's going to be some people saying, I want to open up something very special, something celebratory. Um, and you know, Rebecca, as, as the pandemic started, we were all, I think thinking, what have we been sitting on for a while that we yeah. could actually open up and celebrate at home, uh, with loved ones. And I think we're also thinking about that right now during the holidays. This this is something very special and old spirits in general that s tell a story of a different time. Yeah, uh, we really are drinking through. It's kind of like almost time travel in a way, right? Oh, absolutely. I, I think one of the things we do with all our, our spirits is we produce it as well as the miniature. You get a little book, a tasting book that talks about not only the spirit and, and how it was made and, and where it was found, but also about what was happening in the world when it was distilled. So whether that is not what was happening in 1980 or what was happening, you know, we have a, we have one of our previous releases with cognac that was distilled in 1925, which is actually the year that my father was born. Oh. And, and it's just so fascinating to look back and see what was going on. So in 1925, that's when the Great Gatsby was published, and when the new, the first edition of the New Yorker was published. So these amazing things going on. And in 1980, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't got my, um, <laughs> I haven't got my notes to hand. That's all right. But there, so you always get a sort of, as you rightly say, it's about a glimpse into the past and, right. and a sense of. What was I doing or was I even born 40 years ago? I'm afraid I was, but some people who would drink this weren't. And just the sense of place and of, of history is really, it, it, yeah, it's all part of that experience and, and the, the story you, you tell yourself as well as the stories that we tell each other. Right. The fact that we were, the fact that it both 1980 and also as this whiskey matured, it was in wood for for the 80s, for the 90s, and then all the way up yeah. into 2000, the discovery. And then it was sitting there even uh, for you all to discover it. Now, that kind of leads into my next question. As you're looking for spirits, uh, whether it's a rum, a cognac, as as the last drop distillers uh, limited, how do you all go about finding those spirits that you want to bottle and, and put, put your name on? Oh, my goodness me. Well, that's like a sort of multifaceted question because there is <laughs> there's no simple answer um in the very early days when my dad and, and james went up to scotland to try and find the very first release they both spent a long time in the in the, the spirits industry in particular in the scotch whiskey industry so they simply talked to an awful lot of people and said can you think of anything that might fit our bill for being rare, unique, delicious, etc. And and they say the two of them have told us that they, they tasted over a hundred whiskies before they alighted on the one that became that became the first last drop release. And that very much sort of set the scene for the process of selection that you know many are many are tasted and few are chosen. But the way we find things is 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 very varied. So so as as I was saying earlier um, Scotch whiskey is 
is always, scotch is always in plain sight because like bourbon, every barrel is recorded. Everyone knows where they are. But what lies inside is, is not always known or, or that how delicious it might be. So that's one sort of discovery is tasting, assessing, deciding whether it'll last a bit longer or whether something has just reached its peak and, and then it's time to bottle it, which we've done. With cognac, with the cognac I just mentioned, 1925, that was a genuine discovery by the grandson of the distiller who made it because the, the, the guy back in the 1930s had hidden the single barrel of cognac behind a wall of rubble in one of the barns when the, the Germans were approaching the southwest of France. And then it was forgotten about. And his grandson genuinely was doing renovation work in the distillery in the barns and found this barrel sitting there. Uh, so, so that's a, a more akin to the, the sort of traditional sense of discovery. Uh, the rum that we've just mentioned have, was brought over from Jamaica when it was quite young and matured in Liverpool for, well, a very long time because it's 43 years old now. So discovery is a combination of luck, good judgment, knowing the right people, keeping your ear to the ground and tasting, tasting, tasting and trying to learn to trust not my own judgment, but a group of people's judgment and to rely on those. Who, who you work with and who they name An incredible, and, and what a labor of love to find these incredible spirits to bring to the market. Uh, this particular one, I, I'm really impressed. Uh, just, I, I can taste that, that the age on it, and it's, you know, it's, it's bourbon from a different era. I mean, I've had some of the bourbons that are from the 80s, that are from the 70s, that might only have eight or nine years on it, but this really reflects a different era of bourbon and just something uh, so special. Uh, extremely well done on this. Again, the two other releases that you're uh, releasing this fall, you have, uh, you want to do the cognac first or the rum? Which do you want to talk about well, first? Um, I, the, the order of the releases is the bourbon, bourbon then, then the rum, then the cognac. But okay. I've learned over recent tastings that if, I know we're not tasting them together, Tom, but is that the rum, this, this little treasure here, 68.5%, so that's what, 136, 137? Yeah. Yeah. You want to taste that last, because if you taste anything after it, your mouth is exploding. With <laughs> so, so to taste this amazing cognac, which is, but is, which is 60 years old, but, and very floral, very, to say light is to undersell it, but it, it's incredibly spring-like, and it would be completely swamped by by the rum. So I've learned that you need to taste them in a particular order if you're tasting them side by side, right. uh, which I've done a few times. So so the, the, the cognac is a, a real delight, and I've tasted it with some people who know a lot more about cognac than I do. Um, I sort of consider myself to be quite new to this world of spirits. My my dad was a lifelong spirits drinker, but I've I've learned so much so fast. But I would not not like to say I'm an expert. I think I think I'm the everyman. I'm the one who can enjoy it because it's delicious, rather than rather than the the authority, if you like. You're, you're always practicing. You're always tasting these great old <laughs> spirits, and and you're gonna your your palate will continue to improve. That's what we like to say. It's gonna always get better and better. And again, your dad uh, being responsible for um, the variety of spirits brands, he helped bring uh, Bailey's. Uh, Bailey's Irish. Uh, yeah. And that was back in the 70s that happened? He, it, was, it, 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 it was first launched in 1974. They worked for it for about a year beforehand. And the whole principle behind Bailey's Irish Cream was to create a drink for people who didn't really like alcohol. So okay. it, it just sat in this category, which is really essentially, you know, if what you like is to eat a piece of chocolate, how can we turn that into an alcoholic experience other right. than the pure chocolate? And that, of course, was it, it was a masterstroke, but it was also the uh, the result. You know, they talk about necessity being the mother of invention, and it's absolutely true because Grand Metropolitan, who um, who make made Bailey's and now part of Tiagio, obviously, had a a big dairy production in Ireland and a an Irish whiskey 
company too. And as people moved towards more healthy eating and lower fat milk, there was a surplus of cream. So a surplus of cream and a lot of Irish whiskey sitting in the same country, those are the two things that, that led to, to the genius That's idea. Right. Baileys at the same time. I mean, it, so you had to have both of those elements to yeah, yeah. Bring to have, you, had to, you had to have somebody who said, "I think what this needs is chocolate." You had to have the brilliant scientists who who enabled it to stay stable, um, and then an amazing team all working together to come up with this this extraordinary wow. idea. It's it's lovely, isn't it? That is, and, and we always enjoy. And Bailey's obviously it, it's always so wonderful, and it's helped to bring. So the, the whole category really helped to invent a whole category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So yes, so they, James and my dad had a, a wonderful, both had wonderful careers and I think really touched the zeitgeist, if you like, of what people wanted to drink at different times. So whether it was Bailey's, Malibu was another one of theirs. Um, and and then things like the re-premiumization of the, the Johnny Walker brand, which now is, you know, flies as high as, as anything, right. really was a big turnaround with Johnny Walker Blue Label because because the black and the red had become so downplayed that they turned into a sort of bargain basement brand, and it was it was a, a, a desire to reinvigorate this incredible brand, um, which was part of the passion for them. So. So yeah, I think they have a lot to be proud of, not least, which is what they did with this. The last Amazing, year. with with their with their uh, wealth of exper experience and wow. knowledge, they brought this last distillers uh, limited on the map twelve years ago. You all continue to release uh, yes. several releases a year. The other one being the cognac from nineteen fifty nine. Now, which which con house of cognac was was this from, or what's the story? Well, that the truth is we don't know because. Don't know. Uh, as, as you, you'll probably know, and probably a lot of your viewers will know, cognac is almost all blended. It's really interesting that in, in Scotland, blends are somehow seen as inferior to single malt. But in cognac, almost everything is a blend, and it's part of the art of creating that perfect cognac, that you are constantly trying to blend the different different um, regions and the different ages together to create something that is greater than the sum of its parts, if you like. But this, this was blended a very long time ago. And uh, so it would have been probably blended in the 60s and 21 bottles left in the barrel is not a great, not a great That's many. That's not many. That's, so uh, we, we don't have a lot of visibility over who blended it. Well, in fact, we don't have any. And I, I don't know, but and therefore it will have come from several different distilleries, mm -hmm. uh, which is very, very common. And so even even the Hennessy's and Martels of this world are buying in spirit from other distilleries. So it's a it's a beautifully sort of synergistic industry. And there's and, a lot of sharing that goes on there. There's a lot of sharing, and, and I'm sure. It, and uh, fortunately, I was in Cognac uh, with the. Um, the Cognac Association at the BNIC uh, several years ago, and we got to try some some older cognacs. And I know that that really the age on cognac can lead to such uh, the the intensity of that flavor. It's so yeah. so uh, gorgeous. Um, what do you get on that 1959 cognac? What is oh, it? Well, what do you like about it? What I like about it is is that it's it's like a really lovely surprise because the nose. Is incredibly floral and spring-like, and you would never think that that nose was something that was 60 years old. Um, so it's promising flowers and and fruit and, wow. and all sorts of sunshine. I guess it smells like sunshine in a glass. But when you when you start to, to nose it more, you get there's this word used in the world of cognac, rancio, which is the sort of the fire that is very familiar to those who drink cognac. And that's quite subdued. But when you start to, to, to taste it, there's, I wouldn't say there's much more than just the floralness. The, fla the florality is still there, but then you get these rich, ripe stone fruits and almost the noses of caramel alongside citrus. So it's, it's just an extraordinarily balanced and vibrant spirit for something so old. But it also is, 
it's very, very long, very long on the finish, very long on the finish. And, and if, if you were just to nose it, you probably wouldn't guess all of that. So I think it's it's full of surprises and it's really a sort of magical little journey in a glass. So that's what's really char It's really charming as well. That's incredible. And the, and the fact that when spirits do that, you know something and you, you get one idea in your head and then when you go into it, how it has different arcs and peaks. Uh, yeah. That can really make for an amazing age spirit. Um, again, only 21, 21 bottles in the world of the cognac. Mm -hmm. So a few of those will come to the U.S. as well, and the rest will be... Eight, eight in the U.S., seven in Asia, and forgive my math. That's okay. <laughs> six, six in the U.K. and Europe. Someone watching this or listening to this uh, on bourbonblog.com, if they're really wanting to find these... How can they find out where to, where to find the right spirit store that would have one of these? Uh, well, I, I can I can help with the bourbon because, because right. I can put them in touch with the team at Sazerac who can help directly. Right. The cognac, I, to be honest with you, we're not sure that a single one is going to reach a store. I'm afraid. You know, we have, as I alluded to earlier, we have very loyal customers, and I could probably name 21 of them. So right. I think it's going to be a bit of a fight there <laughs> you can contact me and i will always do my best to point you in the right direction thank you for that last drop is is the website you can learn more we we uh we it's 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 a beautiful site thank you with with a lot of we wrote a story on bourbon blog about these three releases the rum again from oh. 1976 which is uh uh, and and it's and it's a high proof too. What was the proof again? You said 136 or something, right? Yeah. So it's 68.5 percent. So I think that is 137. Right around there. 137 proof. Um, yeah. So just super fascinating. Um, there's a, I mean, I don't know how long you've got, but um, a couple well, of yeah, let's hear it to talk about so one is that what we've got here is a really interesting sort of history of american drinking because the whole genesis of the american distilling industry was driven by first the the drying up of the supply of rum when american independence happened and the supply of rum from the caribbean dried up because so much of the caribbean was controlled by the old british empire and then the other thing that that impacted on the need to distill um, spirits locally was when the supply of cognac dried up at the end of the 19th century due to phylloxera. Um, and, and therefore, so for example, uh, and this is a really lovely part of the Sazerac story as well, is that of course the original cocktail created in New Orleans was made with Sazerac, with Sazerac cognac, uh, and that is the, the very origins of the business. But when cognac supply dried up, they had to turn to American whiskies to make their cocktails. Yes. The fact that now it's Sazerac is made with, with rye whiskey. So, so what you've got here is, is the two reasons for the genesis of the American, not that they wouldn't have started distilling anyway, but it's just quite a sort of pretty picture to have that this is. symmetry. Um, so the rum um, was distilled in Jamaica and a bit like what happens in down in Kentucky is the um, the just the nature of the climate, the extreme heat and humidity means that you could really not mature a rum to anything like forty plus years in in the Caribbean because it would evaporate too fast and and the oak would just completely overpower the the spirit. Mm -hmm. So something that's happened over the years especially with rum, is that it's been sailed over to, to colder climates like uh, Scotland and Liverpool and then matured over there. So, and this is this is one. So this sailed, well, several barrels will have sailed over in the, probably in the 1980s, from Jamaica to Liverpool, which is on the west coast of the UK and has all these beautiful old warehouses full of, they were tobacco warehouses and barrel warehouses, which still exist. Beautiful place to, to, to mature because you've got the real impact of the sea coming in off the Irish Sea and a much, much cooler, more temperate climate, which allows spirits to age. 
very much the way Scotch whisky ages in Scotland in a, in a much more moderated fashion. Hence, it's reached this extreme old age. But it is, it's another lovely example of a, of a spirit where the wood has not overpowered the, the spirit. It, it's, it's really, I mean, it's a hell of a, it's, excuse me, it's, it's a heck of a spirit. It's very big. <laughs> That's all right. Very big. And the age on this actually is what then? The, what it was 40, actually? Said. 43 years. It was actually in the barrel 43 years. In the barrel 43 years. We bottled, it, we bottled it in September. And we have, in fact, this is quite exciting for me, we have put um, some blended Scotch whiskey we were holding, uh, which is actually older than this barrel, into the empty barrel to see what, just to see what happens, whether a rum finished 50 year old. Whiskey wow. will be interesting. Watch this space. I'll let you know. Well, yeah, we, I'd love to. I'd love to have you back and talk about that more. And so you put a. You said you put a scotch into it. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to be like a finished, a finished scotch, which will exactly. we'll see how that that wood that impact being in in there for forty three years will. What do you predict will happen with that? Well, I think it's really exciting. So this is this is a, a final remnant of a previous bottling of ours, which was a 1971 vintage blended Scotch whiskey. And that whiskey, it already had time in bourbon, time in sherry wood, and then back into bourbon wood for, for 24 plus years. So, so it already had these immense immensely complex layers of bourbon and sherry and bourbon uh, and it was a really beautifully balanced whiskey so either it could be a complete disaster and the and the, the the power of the wood and the rum will just knock it out or it could just bring another dimension of you can see probably from here the color of this sorry i'm not very good at this it's, it's really it's dark deep dark color so it's likely that um, the, the alcohol content, the alcohol percentage will go up, which never happens with scotch. Obviously, scotch, as it evaporates, the, the ABV goes down. But this will probably push it back up, and I think will bring some more, obviously, some more colour. But I'm excited to see what it does to the taste. And we're going to do our first, we're going to do our first tasting in March. So it'll have had six months in the rum barrel, and then we'll see what we think. You'll, you'll get an idea of uh, of where it's going, how long it needs. Because sometimes those finishes, they don't they don't always need that long. Sometimes it's it'll be and the scotch that you put in there again was how old was the scotch that you put in? It's nearly fifty years old. Nearly fifty. Wow. So quite yeah. an exciting experiment as well. Very exciting experiments from the Last Drop Distillers Limited, and uh, again, ex all these extremely limited edition. The oldest, the oldest thing that you've, I mean, whether it's the oldest thing you've released or the oldest spirit you've ever tasted has been how old? Well, the oldest spirit I've ever tasted is our 1925 cognac. Actually, no, that's not true. That's not the oldest spirit I've ever tasted. It's the oldest thing we've ever bottled. You've released. Tasted, and you would have come across this when you were in cognac, is that there are cognacs going back to the 19th century. It's a really fascinating thing how grape spirit seems to mature, be able to mature for much, much longer than grain spirit. I mean, that's my that's my assessment, is that what is the difference between cognacs and armagnacs and whiskies and, and American whiskies? And it is what the raw ingredient is. So somehow grape seems to last a bit longer, quite a lot longer. Um, and then the oldest thing I've ever tasted is in 2018, we released a pair of tawny ports. So this was a bit of a sort of side venture. And they were from 1870 and 1970. So they were like grandfather and grandson, if you like. One, one made with pre phylloxera grapes in 1870 and the other made with post phylloxera grapes a hundred years later in the same vineyard. So that's now 150 years old. That's the oldest thing I've ever tasted. And the age, especially on that older um, that older one from 1870, what had it done? Oh, it's amazing. It's, it's like Christmas in a glass or Thanksgiving in a glass maybe. Right. It's, it's, it's got quite a lot of viscosity on it. It's, it's um, sort of there's a description of it's re which means that as port gets older, tawny port, it will get lighter. And then around 70 years, it sort of turns back 
and goes darker again. So it's got this wonderful sort of tawny brown, brown color, almost a sort of green flash to the edge of it. And it's, it tastes slightly savory. You know, people use, use the word umami. Right. And I yes. definitely has something. So port is a sweet wine and it's full of sugar. And we absolutely understand mm. that. But there's something quite savory about it. And I think that's, that's really, really interesting. It's got a fantastic nose and it's, it's an amazing experience. Incredible. And even as I'm finishing, as we say, the last drop of this bourbon, just nosing the glass with older spirits, especially with that serious age, Rebecca, just nosing the glass, those elements, uh, there's just something so special just about, you know, the warehouse notes that I'm getting off this, the touch of brown sugar, the depth, yeah. it's almost like a brulee on this, just the glass itself. It's just um, mm. what an old spirit can do not only for the palate, for the lingering, but just for every other element is is so is so special. Absolutely. And that's what the joy of it all is, is these just extraordinary opportunities to taste the past, to taste history, and, and to enjoy it more than anything. All these extremely limited. Uh, you can check out their website, and, and they'll give you some guidance on these. These are, these are very, very limited, and obviously... Uh, the, the venture for you all, the, the journey for you all is something that takes a lot of effort. Uh, the, you know, bottle or barrels of night, bourbon from the 1980s and the other spirits are, are very limited. These, the, the bourbon itself, what, what's the bourbon go for a bottle? I think that's the question everybody's wondering is I know it's, no, it's not cheap, but it's something very, very special. <laughs> it is. I am the worst person to ask about pricing, I'm afraid, especially in the States, but I believe that it's around. Sorry, and forgive me if I'm wrong. I think it's about five thousand six hundred dollars a bottle. I believe. Forgive right around me. there. Right around there. And that's, no, no, if I'm, I'm going to look it up. We wrote it on. Uh, I think it's. I think I'm seeing. Well, it's at uh, two hundred and forty bottles available worldwide. Forty six hundred. So it's right around the five thousand mark. Right about there. And again, you know, we do hear. What's amazing is we hear um, these days. Uh, limited edition bottles that might sell for a couple hundred dollars uh, in the bourbon world uh, because of the demand are, are selling for far greater than that. Yeah. So this this is truly, uh, at the price tag, it is something that's very special for enthusiasts to, to buy, to share with their friends and family always. It is amazing. Uh, and again, something that is very limited that takes you all uh, this is a lot of effort that you all put forward to find these for us. So we really appreciate what you're doing for the spirits industry. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I, th I think that we like to think that in a, in a small way, we're doing the pre pre selection for our customers so that if you're, if you're generally a Scotch whiskey drinker, this is an opportunity to say, well, I'm going to try this cognac because if they like it, it must be nice. And the same with the bourbon and the same very much with the rum is it's a sort of, it's a trusting partnership where we say we, we've chosen it and we promise you, even if rum is not your general dram, it's worth a, it's worth a go. That you're going to love all three of these. And, and I have no doubt that, that would, that's just, it's always going to be something very special from the last drop distillers limited as you think forward to the future, as far as, um, you know, as the tradition for the company has carried on, let's say 20, 40 years from now, what do you think that that the next generation will be finding uh, or will be saying? Will it be a, a bourbon maybe from from uh, from 2020? Will it be, I mean, have you, when you imagine what it might look like 40 years from now, what do you think people will get excited about? I th Well, I think that people will always remain passionate about fine spirits, whether they're, they're young or old. So I hope that what we'll be doing is leaving a legacy of, of demand for quality and that that will continue with the last drop. I certainly think that for Sazerac, it is one of their benchmarks is a belief in, you know, the enduring importance of quality and a passion in what you do. So I think, I hope that some of the spirits that our bottles in the future won't even have been made now. I hope that we'll be looking at other categories like tequila, maybe, and and obviously whiskies from around the world. Very keen to do something with with Japanese. We're very interested in what they're doing over in India, 
and and that the, the the distillers will know when they're making things that that far far into the future, far long after we're maybe all gone, there will be these small legacies for people to enjoy. It's fun to think about what it could be, and to think about actually, uh, uh, you know, if you're a distiller or, or maybe someone who just is an enthusiast, you know, reserving a bottle, you know, and and then twenty years from now. Um, Going yeah. back and, and tasting it, or a barrel, or whatever it might be. I mean, it really helps. This really helps me think about the future of what forty years from now, what a bourbon, or twenty years from now, what a bourbon uh, might taste like. Well, well done, Rebecca. We really thank you, Tom. Appreciate you, uh, bourbon um, live here on both your birthday and on Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll look forward to tasting more of these in the future with you. And when I get back to London, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Definitely meet up with you for a dram. I know you, you have some, and some if I can great drams. Very happy Thanksgiving to all of you as well. And cheers. Cheers. Thank you, Rebecca. Cheers. Thank you.